Alice will join us. She will be late because um, she's teaching a class, but she will join us when she can. So if we're ready to start, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us on our uh, work session uh, Monday, June 30th. Doesn't feel like it. Thursday. Yeah. Oh, did she have Monday? Thursday. Oh, I'll change that. And we're joined by the professionals from Mozart, and I'll turn it over to you folks. Great. Thanks for hosting uh, today's meeting. Um, for those who are joining remotely, my name is Bob Kowalski. I'm a partner at Local Associates. Uh, my name is Marilyn Reed. I'm an senior interior designer at Local Associates. Mark Porterfield, project manager. So uh, we're delighted to be here today. And um, what I'm going to do is turn it over to Marilyn and Mark to uh, just run through the highlights. And if you have anything you want to pause on and would like more detail, feel free to stop us at any time and ask any questions. Um, but basically, we took a um, a day to walk through the building and look at the building itself and then have conversations uh, with Molly and Karen uh, to learn about um, what works, what doesn't work, um, specific concerns and problems uh, that they've experienced uh, since uh, when the building was built. And that's what this draft report kind of summarizes in written and photographic form. Um, and so there are basically two categories, uh, the building, right? The bricks and mortar, and then uh, how the building works programmatically and functionally. Not surprisingly, it's not a terribly old building. It's not falling down. It's not going to fall over, um, and it's uh, for the most part uh, very sound and just has its moments. Uh, so with that, um, I think we should start Mark with the building infrastructure. And my opening mantra is: when we're working on existing buildings, uh, we care about uh, good boots, good coat, and a good hat. Because if you don't keep the water out below ground, above ground, and on top of your head, you're going to get wet. And uh, it's we dry out as human beings, and so do buildings, more or less successfully, depending on what kind of it is. So with that, Mark, can you just summarize what we saw when we toured the building? Okay, and you know, in addition to. We also toured with some of your building's facility maintenance staff, and so they were able to point out a lot of the things that were working for them and were not working. Um, when we looked at the exterior of the building, the, the primary problem we saw was the overall condition of the membrane. You have two roof systems on this building. One is a single single ply membrane roof. The other one is a standing female roof. Standing seamal roof is in generally good condition. The membrane roof is not. It is reached the end of its useful service life and needs to be replaced. There is a report that was prepared by OLA engineers that is calling for the location of several rooftop mechanical equipment units on the roof. So the replacement of the roof can be dovetailed in with that work. So that you know the whole that portion of the envelope gets fixed. The facade of your building is in general the is in generally good condition. The masonry that forms brick and stone that forms most of your facade is generally appears sound. Little little evidence of water damage or other damage. There's a small amount of efflorescence on the stone, which indicates that some water has gotten into the wall. And Leach some of the minerals out of the stone onto the surface. The, the brick generally doesn't have much of that, although there is some staining located 
near one of the bay windows. So, you know, water may be getting in, again, getting into the brick there, working its way out. We didn't see evidence inside the building in these areas where the water is actually working its way through into the interior spaces. So not minor issues there. There is a skylight at the front, over the front entrance to the building off of Croton Avenue. That skylight, the geometry of it was not well done if you want to keep water out of the building because the roof actually pitches back towards the building. And the skylight is flush with the roof surface. So water tends to run over the top of it rather than around. We would recommend that that skylight be either eliminated or replaced with one that is raised up above the roof and a portion of the curtain wall at that skylight be replaced with a probably masonry to match the rest of the building so that a proper cricket can be placed at that roof so the water is directed you know the water is directed towards the building from the pyramidal roof over your entrance vestibule is then directed to either side of the pyramid and doesn't sit or, or worse snow accumulates in that valley and then just sits against the building for, until it melts and there is evidence of water damage on the ceiling in that lobby where above the below the, that skylight and in that general area so at that point water is getting through your exterior envelope and getting into the interior of the building. the foundation appears to be in good shape we didn't see any evidence of cracking or water infiltration through the foundation it's a it's a cast in place concrete foundation if, if it's designed properly and waterproof properly, we really wouldn't expect any issues. And we, again, we didn't see cracking in it, so I, I think that's in good shape. The windows, the curtain wall system has a rather unique problem. We've got reports of bird infiltration into the building. We, the likely source of the intruders are gaps at the base of each vertical mullion of the curtain wall system. There is a approximately three quarter inch gap, and it's large enough for a small bird to work its way into the system. Then now inside the curtain wall framing, it can now get into your ceiling space and start to fly around, ultimately getting into the occupied spaces. So, you know, that's a relatively easy problem to fix. You can get a you can you can get a membrane type expansion joint cover which would cover that opening while still allowing for the motion. It's you know you need to have the gap in, the gap in the system is needed so that the aluminum cap can expand and contract you know, based on weather conditions. But it doesn't have to be an open hole. It can have a flexible cover over it to prevent infiltration by water bugs, birds, or anything else you don't particularly want to tell me. Um, there's another, the other issue with the glass is the design of the building has large expanses of glass going right to the floor. While it creates a very dramatic space and maximizes the potential views to the north and west, which are very nice, it makes some people uncomfortable. Because, you know, if you have an issue with heights, it's not comfortable to be near that is that a problem that necessarily requires a fix? As long as the glass is safe, which means it should be tempered laminated glass, in which case, even if it breaks, it's not gonna pop out of the frame. So, especially in the children's area, if the kids are roughhousing or somebody, something and somebody gets pushed against it, it won't break, sending them falling to the pavement below. So, you know, that's if, it, if that type of glass is already there, well, you're good. If that glass is not there, we would recommend replacing the insulated glass units at those locations to provide for the stronger glass on the inside light so that the safety issue is covered. If you are concerned about people, you know, too many of your patrons are concerned about feeling uncomfortable in that space, a railing could be installed on the floor inside of the glass 
it purely as a psychological comfort, psychological comfort. There has also been a lot of concerns about heat gain in the building. A lot of that should be addre also addressed with OLA's study of your mechanical system, but a film on the glass that reflects more solar energy would help to alleviate the solar heat gain through all of the large expanse of the glass that you have while still preserving the views. The, on the interior, the biggest problem, you know, there's lots of little problems, like the mirrors are too low in the bathrooms or too actually too high. There is no braille on the signage at the elevators. Again, these are easy things to make. There are stairways. Typically, the handrails are not code compliant. They do not have the extension to the bottom required by code. So it's so they should be replaced. In some cases, there's also a vertical drop in the handrail, which is also not code compliant, nor is it, and it also makes the handrail uncomfortable to use. So replacing all of the handrails, but actually both interior and exterior probably should be done. That would also include the front entrance, which has a very wide stair on a large, on a sloping sidewalk. So while it is code compliant in that regard, it isn't necessarily that comfortable to use and it doesn't have enough handrails to really be used. So replacing some of that stair with like a raised platform at the entrance level and keeping the, keeping the relatively level entrance coming from the east and then locating and keeping a portion of the stair at the west would probably make sense. And yeah, you know, that would direct the traffic to a portion of the stair that could be made more comfortable to use. Probably the biggest problem from a technical or code standpoint is the mezzanine. It is not code compliant. It never was. It's when the building was originally built, the mezzanine is too large. The space below. So it's actually not a legal measure, it's actually a story. Based on the construction type of this building and usage, it's one story more than is permitted. So, but there was a change in the code with the current code that might correct that problem, providing you have a voice enunciating fire alarm system, essentially, which after your your recent fire drill, you may know this, that your fire alarm system say something to the effect of fire, fire, get out of the building, or did you just have a horn go off and make a lot horn of and flashing light? Okay, so then you okay, so then you would need to add that feature. The other item is the distance of travel from the farthest end of the mezzanine to the bottom of the stair, because there's only one way off that mezzanine, is too far to comply with. So inches or feet or uh, probably, I mean, we were looking at dimensions on a small scale drawing. We did not field verify this yet, although we could, although I could do a rough field check today, nor did we have CAD drawings that that's something more accurately, but it looked to be about 25 to 30 feet more than it's, than it would need to be. Meaning it's not splitting hairs. It's, 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 it's a big thing. It's yes. a big thing. And that's also, that's also assuming that the, the occupancy load of the mezzanine is small enough that if you have an occupant, if you have a library with a library use where the occupancy load is under 50 people, that library can be classified as a business occupancy. That mezzanine has an occupancy load of less than 50 people. So you might get a break on that. It's that means that means instead of it being if, if you get that break, you're allowed 100 feet. It appears to be that that's about 125 feet is your current travel distance. If the inspector doesn't buy that argument, now you're about 50 feet over, which is considering the limit 75, that's a pretty big fix. The probably the easiest fix for that would be to extend the fire stair up one floor that currently serves the floor below, is directly under the 
which if you're planning to convert the mezzanine into office space would be relatively easy to accommodate with some new layout. So not uh, inexpensive, but pretty easy to solve. Not a shell stop. Got to tear the mezzanine down. You also have another issue which may or may not need to be fixed. You know, maybe an easy fix is right now on the code the building was originally built under the monumental stair that winds its way up through the all levels of the building was compliant provided that it, it had a water curtain type sprinkler system around the stairs you don't have that now which stairs are these the monumental stair that starts at this level works its way up to the, the main level mm -hmm. and there's now an opening in the floor so essentially from a fire standpoint two floors are connected Smoke can travel from one to the other with no obstruction. You have a similar opening going from the main level to the second level, where the stair is over on the east side of the building. And then, obviously, from the second level to the mezzanine, it's open, which it should be by code. So, essentially, the entire build, if fire starts anywhere, anywhere in the building, particularly at the lower level, smoke will quickly travel throughout the entire building. Um, under the current code, that condition will be considered an atrium, which for a three-story building would require a smoke evacuation system, which I doubt that. Mm -hmm. yeah. a, a reasonable solution to that problem is to, at the stair between the first level and the second level, it's already in an alcove, so to close it off, with a partition similar to what you have at that little overlook where the two-story reading room is with the Aztec fireplace. Mm -hmm. We could we closed off that stair with a partition similar to what's at that little overlook. That would divide the building. You'd have a lower level and main level, which would be a two-story atrium, which doesn't require smoke purge and we can make it, you know, so it's, it's not something that's insurmountable given that the building's already sprinkler. And then you have an upper level with the mezzanine, which again would be its own thing and no issues. So when you have a multi story building mm -hmm. and you have enclosed fire stairs that meet the minimum requirements, you don't have a problem. If you have uh, an open stair, which we would think is a monumental or ornamental stair, it can serve as part of the means of egress, but when uh, that monumental or ornamental stair connects more than two, two stories, right? So if it goes from one to two to three, and then goes from three to four in another location, so that that whole path volumetrically is open, it does it causes a non-compliance with the code uh, that, as Mark said, allows fire and smoke to quickly get throughout the building. So um, flooring over or enclosing stairs with either opaque fire rated walls or more expensive uh, fire glass it is a solution. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a life safety issue that is concerning. So. And it's an issue even though the stairs on this level here are separated in space from the ones that go from the first floor to the second floor, but it's still considered one space because it's open, correct? Yeah, the problem is, is, you know, a let's pick up on the bird. Yeah, that's where I was going. You know, a bird, if you let a bird loose down here, that bird could fly up to the top of the mezzanine without having to have somebody open a door. Okay, I understand now. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. and so as the bird flies, so does smoke. Right? Got it. So you suggesting another solution is maybe that each staircase is closed off by a doorway? Just one. Just 
just, just the, there's one stair, the stair that's currently located between the main and the second level, it's already, it's not like it's sitting out in the middle of the room, there's this grand monumental stair, it's tucked in a corner. So it could be very easily be closed off without stopping it from serving its function. Mm -hmm. And the doors could be on hold opens, so even, you know, so during normal use, the doors are open, people can walk freely from, or it can be done with a fire shutter, which would be even less visually invasive. So, so fire shutter is what and what does it do? Okay, if the fire shutter essentially it's a fire rated screen that when the fire alarm goes off, it drops from either it either drops from the ceiling or, or extends over from one side and seals the stair. Now, because that stair is not part of your means of egress, you have two fire stairs that have exit signs on them. Your monumental stair, at least according to the original drawings, does not. So losing that stair in an emergency, your building is still code compliant. Because we have the two. We have the two remote enclosed fire stairs. So a fire shutter would allow that stair to be closed to stop the spread of smoke. And you know, then make the building token and not impinge, you know, the, the visual access to the stair. This is very puzzling as to how this came to exist. This is Space planning 101 for code compliance. Mm -hmm. The page was torn out of the book. I mean, admittedly, the code at that time when it dealt with these kinds of stairs was pretty convoluted. And but generally, if you had a two-story building, you could do it without any issue. When you got into more than two stories, it got very convoluted and required you know, some special treatments of the stair, which don't appear to have been done. Mm -hmm. The mezzanine oops, is to me a little more concerning because I mean, I understand why the mezzanine is too big. The, the original architects probably took the entire floor area of the space below and said, okay, I can be one third of that. And he's okay with that regard. But if you read the next line in the code, it says space must not, the space below must, have, must not be enclosed. Have to be part of the same room. Once you create another room in that level below, the space inside that room can't be used for that calculation. And you have a conference room down there, you have some offices down there, you have a young adult area down there. All of those spaces cannot be used in that calculation. Does everybody understand that? Yeah, I'm rather confused because you've mentioned code compliance a number of times, but it has not. Now, when the building is built, 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 the building is built. Why it's very puzzling as to how these kinds of fundamental oopses came to be. Yes, and I was going to ask that too. Has the fault changed? <laughs> like, um, it is a lot of a couple of years. Yes, yes, it has. And in some cases, like the case with the the atrium issue is based on the current code, but the fact that those stairs did not have the water curtains was based on the original code. The code at the time this building was built. So is there any chance we can go back in time, back in paperwork, and speak to someone who might have approved something? <laughs> or are we just we have to go forward and that's just water mm -hmm. under the bridge? It's Possible, but you know, given that it's an SED library, it would be people from back then who may or may not be there. And oh. no, that answers the, that. The more important issue is approving uh, entities. We call them authorities having jurisdiction, AHJs. Um, if they make a mistake, it's not their fault. If the architect and engineer design something that was non-compliant and they, the AHJ didn't catch it and issued a permit, the onus is not on the AHJ, it's still on the original AE team. 
So um, the roundabout answer to your question is there's no there there, even if we find the person who approved it. Okay. Um, because they're going to say, okay, oops, fix it. And then write. Well, that's, I know that question would come up uh, to and, larger groups. So good to have the answer. Right. And so, all, all of those, I'm sorry to interrupt, but all of those approvals would have come from SED, not from local. Um, approval, not from the building inspector. Right, and the SED has pretty stout uh, compliance review department. So they are pretty, yeah, they're pretty, they're pretty robust they're when it comes to looking at documents. More robust, they're not so robust when it comes to field inspection. So that's why we say it's very busy. Yeah. This is not some nuance here. You know, this is glaring. So SED approves drawings, and and then things are not built according to those drawings. Does that happen? Could that have happened? So we happen? don't have the permit drawings. Right. They're not obtainable because the folks that don't have them, they right. keep them. Um, it's possible that the permit drawings that they approved are correct, and the drawings that were used to build them are different. Possible. Possible. Also, on these kinds of issues, though, I mean the mezzanine. I mean the mezzanine issue. You know, if you look at the at the raw calculations that are on the drawings that we obtained, they were their code sheet was pretty skimpy. So, depending on how enthusiastic the reviewer was. You know, you may, you may have just taken the calculation verbatim and said, okay, this number is one third of that number, it's okay. If you dig more into it, you see, you start adding up the this various spaces and say, like, wait a minute, the number doesn't work. Mm -hmm. My suspicion on that issue, even though it's very clear in the code, is you measure the distance not as the bird flies, but as the person walks. And Mark did a very careful analysis. This isn't a foot or two off, it's 20 or 50, depending on what classification. And quite frankly, that business, calling the mezzanine a business occupancy, just because it's a tiny, it's such a small library, the code, the authority having jurisdiction may not buy that argument. I mean, so it's, you know, it's, it's considering that the entire building is a library, that's that argument somewhat of a stress. So why does it matter? When a mezzanine is too big and it's too far of a distance to get from the farthest, most distally point to the one fire stair off of that mezzanine, time matters in the fire. Yeah. That's why it's important. So you violated all of these codes, basically. No one's going to come back in and say, Unless we have a fire or something happens, well, hold on. We're architects, yeah. we're not lawyers. <laughs> Somebody gets hurt, lawyers get involved. The answer is probably yes. Everybody's the gun is going to get pulled out and it's going to be aimed at everybody. So that's why we are stressing this the importance of this issue. Um, this is a life safety. And quite frankly, I'm of the mind right now that we want to limit the extreme end of the mezzanine to access and just close it off to a code compliant distance, like right now. Because if there is a fire and there's the allowable number of people up there and they can't get off the mezzanine and be and are overcome with smoke. So everybody remembers this horrible fire in Rhode Island, uh, the Great White Concert. Mm -hmm. have, have any of you watched the video? The rear door was locked. Stuff was in the way in the egress path. And as folks were trying in a panic to get out the front door, the one and only door, the human bodies got wedged in the opening and they could they were pulling people so if that were to happen and somehow that stair 
got impassable. And, you know, people who were still coherent and alive were caught upstream on that mezzanine. They'd be jumping. And we all, we saw that on 9-11, right? The, um, when doing early fire drills, the conversation came up that if somebody was um, uh, limited in their mobility, and if you're not supposed to use the elevator in the event of a fire, how would we be able to assist this person with limited mobility down those stairs? Mm -hmm. And and you know that did become a legitimate topic. And one solution was, well, you just tell the fire department people are up there who can't come down the stairs. And you know that wasn't a very comfortable answer. <laughs> you know, well, you know, today and uh, folks on the time has addressed this issue. Why don't we go over? I mean, right now you're building this fully sprinkler, which actually alleviates a lot of the area of refuge requirements. But essentially how that will be handled is you, you designate an area, typically the upper level of one of the fire stairs or theoretically the elevator, if the elevator is, is properly designed to accommodate this function. And, you know, it's called an area of refuge. And essentially it's an area where somebody is in a wheelchair or otherwise unable to navigate stairs can go. In that area is a telephone where they can call out and say, you know, help, I'm, I'm here, come get me. And it's fire rated and has the appropriate required fire life safety fire apparatus in it to call out, ring an alarm, be in there safely in a fire protected way, and be out of the way so that you're not being trampled over as folks are trying to get down the stairs. Um, the elevator, they make egress elevators. Uh, it doesn't look like you have an egress elevator. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, so there are ways to solve this problem. Yeah, and the fact that your building is fully sprinkler, the logic is that a fire, if the sprinkler system will activate and subdue the fire before it gets out of control and starts, you know, blazing through the building and in which case that will limit the amount of smoke limit the spread of the fire and give everybody more time to get someplace safe you know, or, 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 or. but because the mezzanine is the upper level of the building and the entire building because of the open stairs is essentially one giant box wherever the fire starts the smoke will ultimately end up at the ceiling above the mess but because you're sprinkler they don't need areas of refuge. Right. so you're code compliant and yeah. just remember the code is in your right to be concerned if the uh, fire stair were extended to solve the travel distance issue and also had an area of refuge place to park two wheelchairs that was on an oversized landing that didn't impede uh, uh, egress down that fire stair. You, you want to minimize the reliance on human beings for safety. So, and look what happened in Uvalde, right? They couldn't get in the past for whatever reason. If the fire department can't get to the mezzanine fast enough, and someone in a wheelchair gets onto that area of refuge in that landing, they're in a fire protected enclosure. And so human error has a greater chance to correct itself before they leave. I mean, that, the type of wall you'd be required for that stair would be as minimum of one hour fire rating. If, I, if the mezzanine gets, actually, if the mezzanine is, is really a mezzanine, it would still be one hour. And that, which means that. That wall would be of a construction that's actually been tested. And you know, they literally light a fire on one side of it, let it burn for that designated period of time, and see. And they have, you know, heat sensors on the other side of the wall so they can see, you know, what the temperature rise is during that test fire. And if the wall is still providing protection after an hour, it's, you know, the person on the other side of that wall would be safe. And so underwriters, laboratories, tests, assemblies for buildings. We're not proposing testing buildings. It's here. These tests have already been done. Tests have been done. We know what kind of wall to put in. 
And these tests have all been published. They're widely available. The manufacturers and various building products that go into these systems are all aware of them. The contractors that build these commercial buildings are aware of them. So mm -hmm. it, yeah, and we will, and you know, a good architect when they prepare a set of documents will tell the contractor what standard to, you know, what test that wall is supposed to be. And if you've ever seen one of the test reports for one of those things, it is insanely detailed. Uh, literally, it tells you what the maximum spacing of fasteners is. It attaches the sheet rock to the studs and goes into the whole, goes into every detail of the assembly and construction of that system. It's about how it can resist heat in the form of fire, hose pressure from a fire hose, wetness, right, from um, water out of the hose and the like. And the whole point is very few people die being burned up. They die from some mm. smoke. And so the smoke developed index that goes into these fire rate assemblies, in my opinion, the most important thing because it's from the kind of paint you put on the wall to the kind of sheetrock you use. Um, you know, you can imagine when we've all done it at a campfire, you throw a styrofoam cup in the campfire and it burns all these pretty colors and the smoke is really very acidic. So you won't you don't want that in your life safety. But that's what we do as architects. We take care of that so that it's designed safely and built safely. Okay. So, uh, anything else? Well, there's some, I mean, there's some I mean, up, in the ceiling, sure. up in the ceiling of the upper portion of the library, not above the mezzanine, but the open area next to the mezzanine. There appears to be some warping in the uh, finish. Not sure why that's happening. I mean, ideally, those sections would be removed at that point. You can see what's going on above it and fix the problem and then put new sheetrock back to a limit to could be water, mm -hmm. could be moisture, could be uh, not enough hangers. It could be yeah. a lot of it, you know, improper support. Will be movement. I mean, we didn't see staining on it, so water is not my first suspect at this point. You, you mentioned Vivaldi. I'm curious if the considerations you're giving to the space, whether it's the mezzanine or any other area, when you talk about fire safety, do we also apply to a shooter possibly? Is that something that's Taken into consideration, or this is completely separate safety issue. So, um, we do uh, all kinds of architecture at Belgrade, and some of the things we do are called critical facilities. Um, and that kind of more robust design and construction <laughs> comes into consideration. Libraries don't fall into that class. No, not yet. So, you could elect to. Um, designed for that. Yeah. Back in the 60s, when all these new college campuses were being built after the Kent State riots, they were design, designing anti you know, riot proof campuses. So large numbers of people couldn't gather in one space. So, yeah, I mean, you've seen it. Has anybody been to the new Sandy Hook School and seen it, at mm -hmm. least from the exterior? I mean, it's a fortress. Uh, of any place in the United States, any school in the United States, that's the last one that a terrorist is going to get into again. I guess what I'm really getting at is not so much as do you think we need to remake the building to protect from that type of incident, or within the scope of what you're doing, is there a space where you may say, you know what, um, this room, based on the way it's laid out now, could become that safety space. All we need to do is change the door. Or that's not within the purview of what you're talking about. It's not within the purview, but um, once you get into the design stage of fixing these problems, and then the kind of more fun part of our presentation, um, programmatically uh, talking about safety so that, God forbid, if somebody comes in and they get into the children's library, 
what do you do there? Uh, well, it is scary to be, I mean, we know this. It's scary to be on the mezzanine. I think there's only one way off this floor. That's the problem. I mean, that's you go the, that's stairs the or elevator, and if something's happening to stairs or the elevator, so, you're going to have to jump over the railing. Right. I mean, that's that's the problem. Problem. We have yeah. both driven. Take great pause before we rely on that total loud mezzanine. Because if it smells like a duck, it's a duck. The mezzanine, in my opinion, is meant for non people use. You know, in uh, a vehicle repair facility uh, where you need to store parts or something like that. But, you know, it, the code allows it to be an occupied or inhabitable. Yeah. I mean, this one, if there were a stair getting you down off that mezzanine at this end to the floor below tomorrow, there'd be no problem. I'd be sleeping better. But designing in safety would be a conversation we would have so that we would talk about you know, where is it required for staff, for adults, for children, for teens, right? But right. well, before we get to that point, how do we determine whether it's a cost effective effort? Um, because we're not, I'm, I'm, I don't think we're in a position, and I haven't discussed this with the staff, so I'm not trying to put words in their mouth. We, we don't know if we want, we may not want to spend the money to say to you, okay, now that you've done this, go and do a little um, study for us. By the same token, if you've done this, I don't know if what you've done encompasses what I'm questioning. We hadn't thought about it. Yeah, we can think it. about it. Okay. You know, if there are ways to uh, make safe havens in existing spaces, uh, you know, there are ways to do that. But it's a separate study. But it's right. not that hard. Oh, okay. We're happy to add a, a se section to this report to talk about. I mean, one thing that's in your favor is you do have two remote emergency egress stairs. So if you had an active shooter, let's say, by your elevators or something, people could get away from that area, get into one of the stairs, and get out of the building. Now that those stairs are not enclosed with bullet resistant construction, at least they appear to be enclosed with sheetrock walls, which well, which will effectively stop the spread of fire if they're built properly. They do nothing against bullets. But it's an open library, even though it's multi-story. Um, there's no button you can push to say, okay, he came in with an AR, you know. On the lower level, push the button, and the upper floors are safe. That's that doesn't exist, but it could. Right. Um, can you comment about your recommendation? How much space do you have now? And uh, yeah. what much? So, um, if we all go to drawing A103 FFD. See the upper end of the mezzanine with the curved kind of balcony? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's the farthest away from the stair off the mezzanine. Yeah. If you limited the occupiable portion of that end of the mezzanine such that the distance from that limit line of demarcation to the head, the foot of the stair the mark, right. uh, is compliant, then that would be safe. If you start measuring the distance at a, as a, at a point where you have a choice of which way to go, and then you don't have that choice until you get to the bottom of the stairs. So if you're looking at this now, counting the number of feet from the bottom of the stairs, how far in the mezzanine does that go? Um, 75 feet if it's considered an assembly space, which is what it's currently classified as. I mean, I would act, I do have it. Yes, about that. Helps that. A lot. Okay. If it's business class, you get another 25. Okay. So, where does it cut off? Back towards that. The last floor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. About in here. Okay. If it's business class, you could go to the front of the No. No. I mean, about there. I mean, one thing I do have to have a tape measure on me if we want to go up there and mm -hmm. measure it, you know, we can, you know. One of you is welcome to come with me. We can do that. <laughs> but that would mean um, no one does. 
not a locked door that staff can go in. So occupiable does not necessarily mean like people are sitting there because we have seating up there. It's any space that a, a person can go into. So I'm thinking, well, why don't, why don't we just take the seating away up there? So, you know, the simple thing is move the chairs and furniture out of there and put a caution tape. And if people behave, it works. Mm -hmm. If you put up a wall that doesn't have a door in it that prevents you from getting on the other side of that wall, it's full human error can't come into play unless they have so got a hole in the wall. Um, or a screen. It could be a simple mesh. Or what is the now? Or we we what is there take that stair one more. Yeah, I mean I, yeah, there, there, were two, there were two, you know, there's sort of two suggestions here. One is Bob's here's the things you can do today. Yeah. Lock off guys the door the mesh. Well, it's technically code compliant, but it handles the safety. The other one is to push the stair up one more floor, and that's a permanent fix. You now have two ways off the mezzanine. Your distance, your travel distance is much reduced, and everybody's everybody's safe. And what about putting a stair down from the mezzanine at this end? Um, the problem is, is that both stairs will be open. So yeah, ideally, you want the second stair to be in a closed stair. So it's only fifty percent, right? So can be open, mm -hmm. but in the category of yeah, one easy to do tomorrow. Well, yeah. yeah. the good news is, is you have a stair directly below the mezzanine. So to actually construct a stair there, all you're doing is taking the existing stair and building it. It's not free. And it's not going to be all that cheap, but it's it's not like oh crap, I got to build a I got to build a stair on the outside of the building. Or something. Mm -hmm. Everybody understands it would be internal to the building. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it would require that you lose uh, two, four, six, eight minimum of eight ranges. I mean, it would be less if you're thinking of if you're contemplating putting offices up there. It would be, I mean, that the layout of that stair is something that could be incorporated into the office layout. Mm -hmm. So it's not, you know, the end result is going to be intrusive. Building and I think I think we hit the I think we hit the line up there. <laughs> so uh, put that aside. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We just know we were debating whether to lead with that or you know lead with who said love and happy. No. All of that mysterious aside, the solutions are before us, and though it costs money, it's it's pretty easy. Not first shadow. Oh man, gotta transform the building. Yeah, it's not like you gotta trash a lot of other spaces to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, the fix is relatively localized to the actual area of the problem. So let's have some fun. <laughs> that means we, we, the architects will step aside and then. Uh, the people who make fun spaces on the interior of the building. Front and center. Okay. Well, thank you, Mark, for all that information. There's going to be a little bit of overlap. Um, I'm not going to get into all the technical stuff because I leave that to Mark. But, um, so, when we did the walkthrough, um, the 11th, Molly and Amanda and I um, walked predominantly together through the space to, to the interior of the space. And we started on the main level. We walked all four levels, the main level, the lower level, the second floor level, and the mezzanine. Um, just for an overview, we went over programmatic issues, um, adjacencies of spaces on all levels. Uh, we talked about um, a lot of extra circulation space that's in the building, how we might be able to take some of 
uh, the existing spaces that are on each level and possibly consolidate them. And I'll give you some examples and I'll go through each level um, and, and take you through that. We talked about uh, finishes, we talked about lighting, which is a, a, a very big issue throughout the building. Uh, we did talk about the, the extreme heat issue, um, especially on like, like the south side of the building and the west side of the building, which affects a lot of the areas, a lot of the rooms, um, especially the conferencing room uh, where you have AV. Um, we talked about um, needing window treatments. Uh, we talked about the different types of furniture that you have and the sight lines through the building. So I'm going to kind of take you through highlights of each level as we went through it. Um, some of the program issues, starting with the main level, um, one of the key things that we discussed was that patrons, especially uh, patrons with small children and the elderly, have an issue coming in from the parking lot and um, navigating the ramp. And this kind of goes to the exterior of the building, but navigating the ramp into the front um, vestibule. So they, they struggle with that. So that kind of goes to some of what Mark was talking about on the, on the exterior and from the parking area. Um, when you come into the main vestibule, um, the lighting is very dim. Uh, we talked about the possibility of maybe of revamping and redesigning that entire vestibule. There's some safety issues with children possibly climbing on chairs and climbing over and going over to the open area on the lower level, which is basically a, it's a very big safety concern. Um, but there's really no um, wow factor, um, no welcoming feeling when you walk into the main area, the circulation area of library. Um, one of the positive things that we identified was that uh, if there are some nice sight lines from that main area to the back of the library uh, where the information desk is, but we're kind of losing the, the emphasis on where to go when you come in. So that was one of the main concerns of the, the, the welcoming the welcome zone of the library, which is the entry area, the circulation house. Um, the back of house area seems to have maybe a little bit more space that could be better organized. Um, we went to the back area where the information desk was, and there's definitely a tripping hazard where the fireplace is, because you do have the orange cones there. So that was something that was well noted, and you'll see that in the document that we brought for you to review today, some the photographs. Um, that space too, um, with the vaulted ceilings, the, the lighting is, you know, a maintenance issue there. Lighting throughout the entire building is, that's got to be addressed um, across the board. Uh, there are a lot of areas that are very dark, that make the building feel like it's not as inviting as it really could be. Uh, the space where the um, where the fireplace is could be so much more inviting with the big beautiful windows to that face Croton Avenue. Uh, the seating, the built-in banquette seating is not really very comfortable, so we talked about that. The computer labs that are on either side of the fireplace are spaces that could potentially be absorbed into more usable programmable space for the library, whether that goes into the local history room or becomes maybe a more comfortable reading area, because now that you are actually lending um, computers out and signing laptops out to people to use anywhere in the library or to even use at home, uh, those spaces could be absorbed into more usable programmable space. And then when you go into the children's area, um, to the children's room, it's actually got a very welcoming uh, entry, which was something that was very positive. Um, people feel they really like the displays when you come in, but there's kind of like obstacles with some of the shelving being way too high. And in the back area, the lighting is very dark. So there's some improvements that could be made in the children's area. There's some adjacencies, the, the circulation desk for the children's librarian, uh, librarian's desk is could be a little bit more front and center there. 
So we talked about a lot of a lot of details in that area as well. Um, the staircase, uh, and I, I think Mark touched on this a little bit, to the second level is, um, Molly, I think it was actually, I, I think I quoted your words in the report. <laughs> Um, it kind of looks like a fire stair. Visually, it looks like a fire stair. It's not um, visually very welcoming. And we also talked about that throughout the entire main level of not having really nice visual cues or even graphic cues, whether that be through paint colors or nice flooring, um, graphics, things of that nature to lead people through the space so that they know naturally where they're going and where to go next, whether it's with signage or um, color coding different areas of the library. So that staircase leading up to the second floor, um, we'll go up to the second level next. When you get to the top of the stairs, you kind of don't really know where to go. Um, it's a little bit confusing. Um, you see the staircase to the mezzanine in front of you, but you sort of have to look around and figure out where do I go next. So that houses the adult area, the teen room. Um, you have the 900 stacks up there. You have the large conference room up there. Um, but you don't really have any visual cues telling you where to go. So again, it's, it's a similar problem to what you have on the main level. And we talked about lighting issues there. You have the back of house space where you have um, accounting, HR, um, and the director's office, your office. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's just a, a lot of um, kind of a, a mishmash of where do I go from from here? But when I walk up to the top of the stairs as a designer, I want to say, oh, I guess I should go straight up that next staircase. But you look to the left, you look to the right. And you could go in either direction. So we did talk about adjacencies on that floor. The teens um, seem to be kind of plugged into this little back space. They don't have enough room where they are. Uh, they, we talked about um, possibly putting them in another area of the second floor where they can feel safe, that they can feel like they can be cool, that they can kind of expand and. Um, be who they really are and become adults eventually, but um, not being so disruptive to the adults on that level. Their back of house support staff is on the other side of the floor, which is an adjacency that we talked about to, to change. And they don't have enough activity space for them to work in. Um, their space is very dark and the materials in there are not really very fun and inviting for them. So that was one of the issues we discussed. I guess, um, might yeah. be off point, but that space always concerned me that only has one doorway. Is that space, whether it's teams or any other group that may require an entrance and an exit, a double doorway, another location, at the another a side of the room? In other words, it's fine having one door. It's not it's that small, small enough that given its current yes, yeah, given its current use. I mean, if you put, let's say, like a community room in there where you had just rows and rows of chairs, the room would be too too large, and then you need two ways out. For what that space is, is a mix of a reading area and stack space, it's okay at that size. But your point is well taken. It makes you uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. The code is a minimum. Just because you meet the minimum doesn't mean it makes you feel comfortable, right? It just means it's minimally safe. And so you're right to be concerned. Now, whenever you have a vulnerable population, elderly, handicapped, uh, children, or even teens, where they can gather in you know, numbers and there isn't an alternative path, we to be concerned. I mean, there is that small but underutilized room off to the side of the teen area that, that 
a door could be put on the opposite side of that room out into the lobby area via the elevators so we would solve that solve that problem. Assuming the teams stay in that location that would provide that back. There's this thing that is really important for library planning from a staffing point of view. Points of service cost money because people staff points of service. Um, line of sight is critical for monitoring, uh, especially children and teens, in a way that um, makes the library safe without being overbearing, because there's nothing worth worse from a teen's point of view than being watched, right? <laughs> so to be to watch is important. To feel like you're being watched isn't important. Depends which side of that viewing angle. So every door matters. Um, librarians typically like one way in and one way out because they know that a child can't escape, right? <laughs> yes. Um, and, and so points of service matter. Absolutely. Thank you for that thought. Um, you, you make the teen area feel like they're in detention. You won't have a problem with occupancy because they'll go somewhere else. And you do want to draw them into the library. Um, you want them to grow um, from the children's area up to the young adult area into the adult area. Um, we uh, also discussed uh, the possibility in terms of adjacencies of maybe pulling the uh, the circulation desk on the second level out to be a little bit more front and center at the top of the stairs so that when you arrive, you know exactly where you are, um, you know who to go to, you have a staff member there immediately who can answer your questions, who can direct you. And that would be in addition to, you know, the proper furniture, finishes, colors, graphics, mm -hmm. etc. cetera. Uh, we, we had a, a, a fairly in-depth conversation about the large conference meeting room, um, which has AV capabilities, but that room has um, an extreme heat problem, which Mark touched upon quite a lot um, within the building because of the exposure on that side of the building. So we talked about putting in some type of motorized window treatments in there um, so that it would have blackout lining. Um, and we also talked about the fact that that room needed to be very flexible because of the programs that are offered. And that that also needed to be close, not only close to the staircase, but close to the elevators, uh, close to the elevator so that um, it's accessible for people. The other idea that came up that was um, contemplated was where you have the little balcony that opens up onto the atrium space that looks over onto the main level and the possibility of expanding that floor out over to the front to Croton Avenue. We could not use that space for stack space because of the um, the structural issues. Um, not without expensively. Expensively, yeah. yes. Yeah. And I would leave that to to and, and maybe it's possible to do that in order, I mean, if you wanted to, if you wanted to, whether it's stack space or anything else, an evaluation of the footings supporting the columns around that two story space would need to be done to see if they're adequate to take the additional load. Obviously, the B and same with the columns coming up from those footings, those would have to be evaluated. We would just if any structure that was put in to fill in that floor, that would be designed to take whatever, you know, I would personally I recommend that it be designed for library loading to preserve your flexibility in the future, regardless of what you do with it today. But again, all of those, you know, depending on the capacity of those columns and the footings, it may not be that big a deal, it may be a big deal, it just needs to be, if that's something that's being seriously contemplated in the investigation, Done to determine those issues. 30 seconds on library loading and what that means. Okay, well, essentially, library loading is 
can be a minimum of 150 pounds per square foot. That's also based on the height of the stack you're proposing to put in there. Because books are heavy. As we all know, if you pick up a box of books, you're going to feel The trend is the other way. The trend is to reduce the size of the collection. It's been that a dec for a decade since I've been on the board. No, that's, that's what we true. would be proposing. Yeah. If you're going to floor over that space, don't put 84 inch high double sided bookshelves because you don't need them. It also kills the view. It's part of what makes that space. And I think in our conversations too, the wish list was wouldn't it be wonderful to have that space just wide open? You could use it for events, you could use it for you could have seating at the windows, um, it could be an extension of meeting rooms. Um, I mean, we were kind of brainstorming about that and, and actually even talking about reusing those doors elsewhere in the building, repurposing those doors elsewhere in the building. Um, so there were, you know, it was it was kind of a really a working session as we were walking around and talking about the possibilities of that space. Um, and the lighting in that atrium area there, uh, that vaulted area, it's, um, it's really a maintenance nightmare for your staff. Uh, trying to get up into that that whole area, and it, and, the, and the lighting doesn't really do anything for the, the main level anyway. Um, it's also turned so, into a sprinkler nightmare. There's a one of the sprinklers is setting off an alarm, and even the sprinkler people came and looked at it twice and declared that they weren't sure what they were going to do and they were going to try and get a waiver because they couldn't figure out how they were going to access it to deal with it. Yeah, I mean you need to bring in a fairly large and expensive scissor lift. To get a repair, I mean, it's going to be the most expensive light bulb on the planet to replace. <laughs> so those were some of the things that we talked about for the, the second level. Um, when um, that's kind of high level for the second level, there's a lot more information in the document, um, which is a draft document. I won't go through every all of the details of what we discussed on the second level. Um, when we go up to the mezzanine level. Um, one of the, the the highlights of the mezzanine level is that if you're coming up to the elevator, uh, you come on to you open up onto the staircase, and you really don't know where you are. So that was sort of on the the nutty button list of like where do you go? Um, no directional signage, very dark, very dimly lit. So lighting again is a a main concern there. Um, if you're coming up the staircase to the to the top, there's a nice book display there, but also not very well lit, um, and people don't have any way to know where they're going on that level. When you get to the uh, the stacks area, which is the fiction area, uh, that area is not stacked, so a lot of patrons feel like they are really disconnected from the rest of the library. Um, also, the stacks are a little on the high side, so they, they feel a little bit claustrophobic up there. And the heat is a year round problem up there. The positive part of that mezzanine level is that it's got these majestic views of the Hudson River, absolutely gorgeous views of the Hudson River. So it would be wonderful to be able to take advantage of those views, but we have to figure out a way um, to. To do that, but to address all of the things that Mark has previously talked about in the code issues. Um, so that's the overview of the mezzanine level. And then when we go to, we, we had also talked about the possibility of taking that fiction area and maybe repurposing it or relocating it down to the lower level. Because the lower level, which has access to the main parking lot, the half parking lot, it seems to be, it's a huge space, which we're on the lower level now, and it's accessible to parking. Uh, there's ADA accessibility coming in on this level. And it seems to be very underutilized. So one of the ideas was to possibly put the fiction section area down here so that people felt a little bit more connected to the library in general. And also, it would you would be able to hopefully staff it so that people also had um, connection to library staff and could have their questions answered or be given direction if they had questions about different books. 
Um, and then maybe um, pare down or reduce down the size of the art gallery a little bit. It could still be a, um, a rotating art gallery and maybe repurpose the art gallery on this end, um, right outside the theater, as opposed to having it extend all the way out uh, near the main entrance on this level. Um, yes, you may. There was a large setup there in that area. And Mark and I began to look at line of sight to exit signs. They were blocked. So, so, yeah, yeah, that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. that large um, installation. There was a very tall installation that was in place at that time. And it was, you know, if that area started to fill up with smoke, it could have been challenging to find your way out of it. You know, we as architects imagine this kind of flexible space, uh, but you always have to remember that in the event of an emergency, however, uh, staff sets up the space matters. You got to preserve that line of sight to uh, exit lighting, emergency lighting, egress points of egress. So, what uh, Marilyn? Talking about here as an idea to help solve that problem or prevent that eventuality. And just to clarify, you know, this was a very collaborative walkthrough um, with Molly and Amanda, and these are were you know ideas that um, we certainly did not come up with all of these ideas. These were ideas that came from you from the from the library staff uh, in terms of your wish list of what you would like to do with the library. Um, a lot of the recommendations that you'll see in here in the recommendations section, um, you know, in terms of lighting and and other things like that, are just our ideas from what we can do from an interior standpoint, and obviously uh, from um, an infrastructure standpoint. Everything that Mark has talked about, so. That's the fun of my position is to be able to collaborate with you to come up with uh, these ideas for your space. Um, um, my background uh, spans 10 years engineering, design, and then architectural. For me, the thing that stands out the most for me is. There's no arrival, no matter where you are, whether you're coming in the front door, coming up the stairs, and you go, where am I? Um, librarians and their staff are welcoming with open arms. They're here to serve the patrons, right? And when they're, the space is not set up so that when people arrive in the front door, from story to story, the patrons don't get this feeling, this kind of open arms, welcome feeling from a point of service staff. Um, it's a shortcoming. And I see that throughout the interior. Uh, it's, a, it's a very beautiful building. And the kind of sustainability, I mean, it's dripping with that intention. Uh, the fact that the lighting is so energy efficient that it's dark. The glass is so expansive that it's hot. The um, stairs and the elevators not being next to one another so that they reinforce one another. Because we live in three spaces, human beings. And wayfinding is made easier, not by like a hospital, the colored lines on the floor or the wall, but by being memorable. And so when you reinforce horizontal movement, with verticality in a space uh, and vertical circulation. I mean, if the stair and the elevator were next to one another, and when you got out of the elevator, you saw this, right? The open arms, whether it's a reference desk or a circulation desk or a point of service, you would remember it. And we've been here, right? And you, I get turned around in this building. 
what's on the other side of this curtain? Outside. What, Outside. What? So which way are we looking? Towards the river. Towards the river. You know it, right? <laughs> Somebody who comes in here, they don't know it. And so when you come into a place uh, and the your, your orientation in three space is reinforced because of your connection to the outside, it helps. And the curtains are closed because it's a theater. It's just mind boggling to me that the curtains always want to be closed because it's a theater and it's hot, right? But there's this great view, but you can't look. Right? It can also work and have you come into the theater, but it's going to be kind of a strange path to get to the doors that let you into the theater. So this room <laughs> is especially curious to me. Uh, I don't know how else to put it other than to say it tries to do so much and be so much at one time. And there's this idea of this movable wall, which is my that's another issue. Um, that when it's set up, if you're on this side of the wall and you fill this with loose seating, the performers feel like they're ready to fall in your lap because it's so close. When it's open like this and you're over there. Hello, you know, it's so <laughs> far away. But if, you know, when you talk about flexibility, you're trying to put raking seating in a theater with a stage that's uh, low enough. Uh, so uh, if you're on the floor on this half, when the partition is deployed, you're not cramping your neck, but it's not high enough because if the seating is all filled, you have to look on either side of the person's head in front of you because the stage is high enough. So it was this space that was trying to be so much, and there are all these short comments. And that's just, you know, it is what it is. And you know, it works, you make it work, right? And it's, it's fine. It's not, you know, this is. If you look at the floor plan of this building, uh, this is the most interesting looking thing graphically on the floor plan, right? And it's the least memorable space uh, because you, you don't know where you are relative to the rest of the building. The arrival sequence is back down around the corner. You're going to a Paramount theater, right? Um, or even the Benheim theater. Jewish community. So yeah. Yeah. There's this whole lead up to arrival that makes the experience that much better. Um, that's what I would think. Like. Adjacencies, where things are, arrival, welcome, memorability, that's what we would be looking to improve here. Now, we're not going to gut the interior. There are ways to do it. Um, economically, uh, so that things are just reoriented in the right place. And that's what a, a concept design study would be. And it would be collaborative, as Marilyn mentioned, that uh, it would be a brainstorming session. Uh, uh, we don't use trace paper anymore, but we would bring trace and talk about what about this, what about that, what we thought about this. And because there's opportunity here, it's not like you're. You have 35,000 square feet. Yeah. You're not hurting for square footage. Right. Um, but in funny ways, spaces are small here, right? Because it's not arranged just so. So, furnishability uh, is important. The mezzanine, which is meant to be this open space that you look up to and look down from, is filled with bookstacks. Is tall, and there are these pockets of places to sit. And it's just uh, odd to me that a kind of vertical prominence, right, is just housing Indiana Jones warehouse books. So uh, it's it's a it's a wonderful building, and there's this the right amount of adventure here. It just needs. 
to become what libraries are today, community centers that are memorable places where you want to go, regardless of your age. Um, you know, it's, I keep, whenever I keep looking at it, it's like, okay, these kinds of problems existed in libraries in the 70s and 80s, but not this new. Love the opportunity to continue to help, but you know, it's, this is a, a first draft. Take a look. We're happy to add, you know, this kind of uh, discussion about um, safety, um, terrorism, anti-terrorism issues. Because it's it's part and parcel to many building projects these days, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bob, do you would you mind talking um, for a minute if you if you feel um, it's okay to? I think you took a look at the OLA um, recommendations for us as well. Could you talk a little bit about your thoughts about their recommendations for the HVAC? Yeah, um, and we reviewed it, mm -hmm. and I had a discussion with Jim Dolan at OLA, and <clears throat> there are moments in that report where they say. Here's our thinking, but be careful. Coordinate it with structure. Coordinate mm -hmm. it with yes. whatever you're going to do architecturally. Um, at first blush, uh, it all kind of makes sense. Uh, there are different options, mm -hmm. so you don't have only one solution available to you. Mm -hmm. uh, what Jim and I talked about the most is if we're going to be rearranging space and putting offices here instead of there, uh, and relocating uh, patron intensive space uh, away from hot zones or more toward the view, uh, the hotter zones, right? The south and the west. HVAC becomes all the more important. Mm -hmm. So um, Mark cares about not populating that roof to block the view with equipment. So you know, they're not proposing that, but we should. Yeah. Is it? Yeah, I mean, right now I looked at their proposal also. Mm -hmm. They are proposing a large unit on the roof of the second level to serve, to provide, because that's the, from an engineering standpoint, that's the shortest run for the unit the space being served. Yeah, no, no, I did. Yeah, I did. Yeah, they are. And so, you know, we would recommend, and that's why. There were all those caveats in there. It's like, okay, here's this is the first pass out from an engineering standpoint. Before you actually implement any of this, you know, check with structure, check with the function, you know, the, the programming of the spaces, because you may want to move the stuff around. That same equipment can be located on the roof of the mezzanine, doesn't screw up any views because the, the the mezzanine reminds this library reminds you of final. I'm in the bottom entrance, you work your way up through the woods all as you're finding all the stairs and everything to get up there. You get up to this narrow stair going up to the top, and then you come around the corner and boom, there's the view. So you made it, you got to the top here, and you get the, you get the reward of this great view. The last thing you want to do is block that with a large area. So what I would want to be talking with OLA about after we get a little further along in a concept design is um, this classic issue on HVAC. A central system or several large systems uh, that are economical to build as long as you handle distribution and control properly, which is hard to do in an open four-story building, right? versus uh, system by systems that are uh, designs on a space by space basis, where you have a bank of central outdoor units, but then individual units uh, in each of the rooms. Uh, and with today's variable refrigerant technology, which says the hotter it is, the more refrigerant you send to the unit so that it cools it off more adequately. On a shoulder season day, like late April or early May, we don't need that much air conditioning. We don't send all the refrigerant there. So it's very sustainable, which wasn't, it was around, but it wasn't as uh, 
in as much use as it, as it is today. Um, on the other hand, there's a bigger upfront cost mm -hmm. to put in all these individual systems. Uh, the control is much better. Uh, if you have a system in a room that's 200 square feet, 400 square feet, 800 square feet, or this big, and they're all individually controlled and individual systems, you don't have the problems you have. When you do a central system and have this kind of exposure to the west and the south with expansive glass uh, and glass that is not so effective. Um, it puts pressure on ductwork distribution and balancing and uh, bells and whistles in those systems like reheat coils and uh, VAV boxes, variable air value control boxes that allow you to temper the temperature of the air and the volume and its delivery. So you got a fan that blows more or less air per you know, cubic feet from is how they measure airflow. Uh, you have a volume damper that says uh, this much because you can throttle it way down and still blow air really fast or you can open it up and blow it fast or slow. And then reheat coils, uh, if you're, planning for 100 people in this room and using that central system to cool this space fully occupied. And this system is serving offices that are uh, have two or four people in them. You need to either use a VAV box to throttle back the airflow or put in a reheat coil, which is just mind boggling. Let me run a condenser in the middle of August so I can cool this space. And then over there in the small space, where two people are freezing, keep the air back up. <laughs> and, um, it's done all the time. And it's code compliant. Uh, let that sit. Right? So there's this argument, uh, but it's about first costs and uh, operating costs and effectiveness. Uh, but they have a number of options that are all perfectly viable. There are these issues about sight lines, controls. But you've got the right engineer. Uh, they're very good. Mm -hmm. I've worked with them for over 30 years. Um, we have a good collaborative relationship. It's not like butting heads. Oh, no, architect, you can't do that. It's, you know, so we work together. We don't impose the design on them and they, they say, OK, are we going to eat cool this? We work together to think about it at concept. So, yeah, they're not locked into anything, and neither are we. But their first piece is just a first initial step. Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing you may want to consider if, if we go ahead and put a lot of equipment up on that roof, that the access to that roof right now is a vertical ladder through a relatively small hatch, and it doesn't have an extension on it. So it's very difficult for a service person to go up and down that ladder with equipment mm -hmm. to service those needs. It, that currently that, that ladder is in a closet space. So it probably wouldn't be a huge deal to replace it with a ship's ladder, which is essentially a steep stair, mm -hmm. which would make the access up there a lot easier, which would encourage the maintenance staff to actually do their jobs. And make it easier for the job to be done, which, you know, a ship's ladder or an alternating tread stair in a wider mm -hmm. opening with guardrails around the opening, mm -hmm. um, or extending, you know, a bulkhead up there with a rib stair so you could actually walk up. And it wouldn't affect the architecture. I'm this, not familiar with this area of uh, technology you're speaking about, but I get the impression that it's a given that we could put tonnage of weight on the roof in spite of the fact we're on a hill and we have concerns about our back uh, retaining wall, whether it's holding up. And if I understand, uh, I don't know if it's math or geometry, but the more weight you put on something at the height, the more it compresses downward. And wouldn't that add to the uh, significant concerns that we already have about? So it's not a given. Okay. Uh, Jim warns about it cautiously in his report that structural analysis would need to be done 
because they're mechanical engineers, not structural engineers. Um, and we would want a structural engineer to weigh in. But right, the heavier the thing is, okay. the more it will compress. And when you're compressing soil on a hill, uh, and if what we've heard is true, that the fill back here is, wasn't done well, when you push down on a lump of sand, it moves laterally pretty easily. So it's surcharging uh, the backside pressure on that wall, which is already a concern. Right? So. Yeah, well, the other, you know, the other side of that is, at this point, we don't know what the footings of the building are sitting on. Uh, you know, obviously a retaining wall was built to provide the space for the parking, but that retaining wall is 75 feet, give or take, away from the building. So the footings may not be putting a lot of surcharge on that wall. That may just be the weight of all the fill that's holding up the parking lot. Meaning if they're down low enough, and depending on the soil type you have, the angle of repose and the surcharge angle against the inside of that retaining wall. But we also know an adjoining property is experiencing um, similar issues. But specifically, they have what collapse or what's the, the moose the moose lodge property right next door over here. They just have sinking sinking, sinking a parking lot, and then but didn't That's something fall or collapse further down? Something so fall, yeah. yeah. Anything that would be done here. Um, I, I would recommend a uh, structural engineer be involved and that that structural engineer is probably going to want to know the nature and extent of the footings. So that would require probes. So if you're going to put a unit here and it's going to be carried by these foundation walls, he or she is going to want to know what those foundation walls are and what the soil is. Mm -hmm. And so soil borings would need to be done so you can figure out the soil classification, where the water table is, what the bearing is. And some of that information you may already have. You may not. <laughs> you, may, you may have it, you may not. I mean, worst case scenario, you don't have it. We have a guy come out with a drilling rig and he does several borings around the perimeter of the building to give us some idea of what's going on. Um, that's worst case. Best case, you know, we have the soil reports so and we just shoot them off to our engineer and say, here's what you're dealing with. Something like that. when they were looking at the wells previously. We have a lot of reports. Mm -hmm. A lot of reports. Yeah. So we would have to have have out back. Install, you know, in order to design that system, more information would have had to have been known about the soils. So that is kept a good mark. Yeah, but I mean, it's optimistic. But the fact that, it was, but the fact that that presumably those boring would be done. Yeah. You know, yeah, boring was done. So at least, you know. Whether the system was designed properly or not, who knows, but it, they're more likely to be a geotechnical report that tells us what we've got. So along the lines of the mechanical system questions, um, my uh, advice is before you do anything more with OLA, let's make sure we're um, keeping any potential architectural reorganization in mind so that they work together instead of fighting. So we know our roof is bad. And we know we've got all these pieces that we're going to have to basically schedule. I was up on the roof and I walked every inch of that roof. Um, aside from the sea of pavers that are up there to weight it down so it doesn't blow away, um, it's very squishy. So everybody knows what rigid insulation is. If you've been to the back corner of Home Depot or Lowe's, you see big boards of Okay. Either yellow or white okay. insulation. If it's yellow, it's called polyisocyanate, which is typically the roof insulation, which goes under the roof member. When it gets wet, does anybody know what sponge candy is? Mm -hmm. yep. So sponge candy is yellow in the middle, right? Yeah. And when it gets wet in your mouth, it dissolves. Yep. So when polyisocyanate insulation gets wet, it loses its structural property and gets squishy. There are so many squishy spots on that roof uh, and places where it, the membrane clearly had a hole in it that was patched. 
and there would be patch after patch after patch of the, uh, and uh, there was a place originally that was never finished with the coat bank that had to be finished after occupancy. So, sorry. It's painful, I think. Advil, Motrin, or a weed? Take your choice. <laughs> Scotch. <laughs> so we know we need money to do all of these things and we need to do them in a coordinated way. How quickly can we find out how much money we need so we can go out and ask for it? Right now, what we would need to do is, and right now we sort of handle on what the technical deficiencies are. So we need to work that in with your programmatic desires and then you know, from that and working with you, we can develop a list of priority, you know, prioritization. You know, what's a life safety thing? What's some, this is something we have to address now. Mm -hmm. What is a a situation that if we don't fix it, it's going to be more expensive to fix later. You know, it's, it's life safety, the the stairs that let smoke through the building, the non-compliant mezzanine. Those are all life safety problems. You want to fix those right away. The roof, if the roof is compromised and water is getting into the building, the longer you wait to fix it, the more it's going to cost the fix. So you want to do that quickly. On the flip side, um, you can keep taking a band-aid approach. It's leaking there. Patch the roof. Patch the roof until you have that grander plan in place. Because to put a new roof on now without knowing where the new unit, HVC yeah. units are going to go and what kind of structural steel support they're going to need. and you don't want to be cutting in new support yeah. and curves and dunnage after your new 30 year roof has been installed. Um, so, is the roof going to like fly off tomorrow? No. We've waited it down. Waited <laughs> down. It down. <laughs> is it going to leak tomorrow? Probably here, there, and everywhere. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be a deluge? So, my recommendation is the roof's important, you know, good hat, but probably okay to band-aid it for a while until the grander plan is in place. Um, to get a handle on what it would cost, we can bring three roofers out here to give you a price to replace that roof and its insulation for getting the HVC, just so you have order of magnitude. Mm -hmm. right? We know what it costs to rip and remove. What, do you, what's the footprint now? Um, 16,000 square feet. Something like that. Well, it's probably a little less. Yeah, some of the metal roof. Some of Let's just say 15,000 square feet. We know it's about at prevailing wage 40 bucks a square foot to take a roof off and put a new roof on without any other kinds of issues, right? So you can do that kind of order of magnitude, net back of the napkin calculation. So, how much? Say that again. Say 15,000 square feet times 40 bucks a square foot. And that's a number. And so you can aim for that number plus or minus 25%, right? Um, or you can bring roofers here and get numbers that are going to range from 75% of that number to 25%. Yeah. Yeah. Can, so, I, can I ask a, a silly question? Um, one of the things, if you know, if we do go forward with the larger project, and we will need to go forward with HVAC, we know that. Um, would it be possible or recommendable? I'd love to put solar panels on that lower roof to offset the loss of the geothermal, but would that um, make it so that the view is compromised? So, uh, 30 years ago, solar panels um, had an efficiency rate of about seven or eight percent, meaning every BTU energy the sun put in, you got seven or eight percent of that out. The best panels now are 40 to 45 percent. Those are rigid uh, solar panels, like Sharp, any of these glass panels that we see, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to amorphous silicone, which is flexible, which most people are not using because they're not, they were peeling off and they're not, their efficiency ratio is not that great. Um, but what has improved is you saw you see solar panels are always at an angle, right? And you always wanted them facing the sun. So orientation really matters. It matters less now because of the technology. So they can be flatter mm -hmm. and the orientation matters, but matters less. 
and what's really critical is that the technology uh, has advanced such that if there's a tree in the way and it shadows, you know, casts a shadow on this panel, it would take all the panels offline in that array 30 years ago. And now it just takes this panel offline. So, and panels are about eight pounds a square foot. Okay. Which is not light. Yeah. It's not insurmountable, but that analysis would need to be done. Um, right. You could put flat panels on that roof that are low enough. Now, if they're dead flat, they're not going to be as efficient as if they're slightly elevated, um, but they'll be out of view. Um, but when the flatter the panel, the less the solar panel gets so hot that you can burn your hand out, right? When they get a little bit of snow on them, they would not work 30 years ago. Now the light that filters through still allows the solar, solar panel to work and it warms up and melts the snow off. Um, so if you have a flat panel and you get 30 inches of snow, it's not gonna melt the snow off. And now you've got the eight pounds of square foot plus the uh, melting and freezing and thawing snow this high on it. So that kind of extra snow load has to be considered. Whereas if it's a pitched panel, a sloping panel, it would slide off and lose it. So it's not just the eight pounds of square foot. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you can almost bet that there isn't enough reserve capacity in that roof as is mm -hmm. to put a flat panel on it. It would have okay. to be on. I mean, I'm getting at something we would have an engineer check as part of that process. The one thing that works in your favor, though, is the roof system you have now, because it's a ballasted roof, it has its pavers on there. When you replace it, we would recommend you use an adhered roof where it's essentially attached. I thought you were going to say it was going to be easy to remove. It's just any of us could pull it off. <laughs> well, I mean, once you take, yeah, once you lift the paper, once you lift the pavers off, you can probably grab one corner of it and just seal it up yeah. like an area roof. But once you, <laughs> but you know, that's why the pavers are there because yeah. it's to hold it down. But the pavers are heavy, so you can take the pavers off and put in an adhered roof. That's probably even with the extra insulation that will be required to meet the current code, it'll still it can still be lighter weight than what you have. But our our power trio of you guys, a structural engineer and OLA, will help help us figure out if we could do so. Yeah, I mean, we could. Yeah, yeah. So all of that is well. We back to Mark's point. point. This is just written in kind of layperson's. Take this. Tell us if you have any questions, some things aren't clear, what's missing. And then once we kind of get it into a tuned up shape, then we could prioritize it saying, do this now, do this soon, mm -hmm. do this if you can. And then approximate budgets could follow this exercise so that you can begin to answer that question. Mm -hmm. You need a grant for this. And it's also that. Also, you know, this document is the start of, you know, given all the things, you know, all the moving parts that we have here, mm -hmm. it would probably be advisable to do a master concept plan that encompasses all of the things that have to be done to keep the building healthy and all of the things that, make, that have to be done to make the building serve your needs and your constituents' needs. And we put that together, a master plan, and now all of those items can be budgeted, and also the implications of spatial reprogramming can be taken into account with the design of that of those replacement HVAC units. You know, if you're going to be making massive changes to the interior of the building, such as filling in the two-story high space, that's going to have a significant impact on how the HVAC system. Yeah. It probably means that all the distribution ductwork has to change. You're going to move this, that, here, or there. Mm -hmm. Maybe most of the distribution ductwork. Okay. Oh, we didn't talk about the mechanical. Yeah, the mechanical room is basically a floor with a couple of getting through. Um, when, you know, the good news, the bad news is, is those rooms are tight. A submariner will be very comfortable. Particularly, uh, like a, particularly an old World War II bed. Maybe right at home. Um, now, if a lot of these, if a lot of that function is going to end up on the roof, 
some of those units may come out of it, those rooms, those rooms can be more usable. Also, you have a lot of space on the basement. You put in a new boiler room recently, and that room was designed properly. There's room for expansion, there's room for service. The room works. The old ones don't. They are, you know, it's amazing those things can get serviced. If we can reclaim some of that square footage, wouldn't that be more good? And, and again, if a unit that's in, and the one on the second floor is, is equally equally bad. So if, if, if you need to get one of the units out of that room mm -hmm. in the process of doing this HVAC upgrade, you'll make that space a lot better. So that doesn't mean you just start throwing crap. <laughs> no, Molly won't allow that. <laughs> I mean, right now I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see a lot of that in this building because we just don't have the space to do it. But it, I mean, that is a common thing that happens in mechanical stuff. Stuff gets thrown in there just because we don't have any place to put it. Fortunately, we have that large basement space. We do all that stuff. Sure, that agitates me that people. <laughs> I would say okay, so in closing, you know the feeling you get when you walk into the children's library? Mm -hmm. It's that kind of cool feel. Mm -hmm. There needs to be more of that um, throughout the library. And yeah, the possibilities are there. Yeah. It's not like it's a terrible book. It's a mm -hmm. book. It just needs to be. Yeah. And like, I mean, that mezzanine could be a great space. It's got a spectacular view. It's like it's a place where I, you know, if I were to come into this library and I wanted to grab a book and then sit someplace in the library and read, that's probably where I'd want to go. But, you know, it's, you know, right now it's very underutilized. And, and hot. And at the wrong time of the year, <laughs> it's just too bloody hot. I can't imagine what the temperature is going to be like tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, well, well, I'm going to go up there. I'll probably go up there later today. And I, Try to get some idea of what that real travel distance is. Mm -hmm. So we'll see how high it is up there. Anything else? A quick question with kind of a Maryland scope kind of thing. If we know we're having some problems right now, um, furniture and arrangement wise, that you know, probably don't have. You know, major space implications in terms of the wall has to come down for things like that. Can we reach out to you and, and you know, I'm sure your prices are better than Demco. Because <laughs> I know we did talk about a couple of things. So if you want to set something up separately, I can talk to you after this and set up a separate meeting. Okay. Okay. That would be great. And then I can give you a heads up about what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, also, following conversations we had about lighting, um, and you pointed out how different bulbs are used throughout the space. That would be an easy fix, wouldn't it? If we just, yeah, if we could do some revamping in certain areas yeah. as a, you know, a temporary solution or an immediate solution for certain areas, we could kind of walk through. Yeah, and take one of those on that side of the, yeah. Well, and we're going to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. I think I, I noted it in some of the recommendations um, for possibly relamping some areas now. Um, executive summary mm -hmm. observations. Would we be able to get? Um, more copies of this for the other trustees who couldn't make it today. Well, thank you. Great. That would be helpful. Yeah, that would be helpful, please. Thank you. And we can send it to you. It's only uh, just under 10 megabytes, so we okay. can email it to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Do you need a large set of those drawings? Do we want a large set? Sure. Thank you. They're your drawings. We okay. Printed a copy of them. So, yeah. I have a set that's not tattered. And
Yeah. It's not the complete set. It's just no. But still, sometimes it's yeah. They thought that was going to happen with the furniture.